Uh, Leo, uh, this is art, um, philosophy, department of uh, philosophy. His research, research interest focuses on uh, semiotics studies and cultural semiotic analysis. The topics uh, today's talk is the uh, cultural production of memory and uh, oblivion, attention and distraction, utopia and dystopia. And today we are we also pleased to uh, invite uh, Professor Wang uh, Tia uh, uh, from the Department of Foreign Language and uh, 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 our our. To, to give uh, more than uh, welcome. And also, uh, uh, Professor Huang, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Professor Huang, uh, uh, from Chinese, 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 uh, Chinese language. Uh, so please uh, join us to give more than welcome to uh, Professor Leo. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, coming here at this uh, quite early time in the morning to listen to me. Uh, it is a great pleasure and a great honor being uh, in Shanghai, invited as a uh, visiting professor by the University of Shanghai. I would like to thank in particular my colleague Zhang Jun and uh, all the academic community of the University of Shanghai. I hope that uh, my seminar will be uh, interesting for you and helpful for some of your investigations, especially for graduate students. Um, unfortunately, I must apologize. I do not speak Chinese. Uh, I would like to present this seminar in your language but uh, I unfortunately must speak English. Uh, so as a consequence, since English is not my mother tongue either, uh, please, if there is something you do not understand when I talk, please interrupt me. I'll be very, very pleased to reformulate what I say. So the title of uh, our uh, seminar today is the semiotics of the past. Uh, this lecture will be followed by another lecture in the afternoon devoted on the semiotics uh, of the uh, present and a third lecture that will be delivered on Wednesday uh, devoted on the semiotics of the future. What uh, we are uh, going to be interested in is uh, the way in which societies and cultures produce a certain idea of time, a certain ideology of time. So giving rise to a cultural production of different aspects of time as regards the past, memory and its opposite, forgetfulness, oblivion, as regards the present, attention and its opposite, distraction, and as regards the future, utopia and its opposite, dystopia. We're going to deal with these three oppositions uh, in uh, each of the three lessons. But for the moment, I would like to give a general introduction to my topic. So, I chose as a background of this first slide an image that represents myself while visiting some uh, Roman ruins. These Roman ruins are situated in a uh, small uh, village called Volubilis, which is close to the Moroccan city of Meknes. There are several elements in this picture 
that are interesting to us several elements that concern the representation of time, the construction of memory, and uh, the different ways in which we can um, evoke a past time in the present. The main element of this picture are, of course, these um, columns. These columns are ruins. We call them ruins exactly because they work as signs. Signs of what? What do they signify? Well, they signify what they were part of. These columns belonged in the past to a whole building, to a temple. So by looking at these columns nowadays, we can have a mental representation of what they used to be. We can have access to the past. This is the way in which ruins work from the semiotic point of view. They are signs of the past. But in this picture, we don't have only columns referring to the past. Also, the image of myself refers to the past. It's not a faraway past. It was just um, last year, in April 2017, I visited the University of Meknes in Morocco as a visiting professor, as I'm visiting you today. And I took this picture. So, this photograph uh, reminds me of a close past through an image of myself that resembles me, is a little bit like myself, but at the same time, it is not exactly myself as I am nowadays. For instance, my hair is shorter. Um, my clothes are slightly different. Um, the weather was uh, a little bit different. So, by looking at this picture, I can travel at least to two different pasts. I can travel to my recent past, one year ago, I was visiting these ruins close to the University of Meknes in Morocco. But I can travel also to the distant past. Many centuries ago, some people were living there, uh, were uh, living according to Roman customs. There was a temple over there. Uh, these columns would be part of a complex building, and so on and so forth. Now, the four main dimensions about which we are going to uh, discuss are listed in this second slide. You see, time is a very complex philosophical topic. It is an important topic in everyday life. It is an important topic in human existence. And it is also an important topic in uh, uh, many of the academic disciplines in natural sciences and, of course, also in humanities. I would like to introduce this slide by reading you uh, a sentence that is very known in the Western world by a scholar called Augustine of Hippo, who was one of the main Christian philosophers. Uh, in a very famous book called The Confessions, Augustine writes in Latin, I'm going to read in Latin and then translate it into English, about time. Sinemo ex me querat scio, si querenti explicare velim nescio. If uh, someone asks me uh, what is time, I know, I know what time is. But if someone asks me to explain what time is, I don't know how to explain it. So what, what does this sentence mean? It means that we all have an immediate experience of time. We all live into time. While I'm talking to you, for instance, I have an awareness of the time that it is. You know, it is approximately 8.35, 8.40 in the morning. I have awareness of the fact that I can talk to you for an hour and a half and then I have to stop 
and then there's going to be half an hour of questions. I'm aware of the fact that you might um, uh, listen to me for a certain time and get, then get bored and then get distracted, then get tired. I can have an awareness of the fact that this building uh, has been built in a certain epoch. Uh, I have an awareness more or less precise of the age of the audience and so on and so forth. But most importantly, I'm aware of the fact that while I'm speaking to you, time is flowing, time is going by. The time of my life is passing while I'm talking to you. So this is an immediate awareness that all human beings have. But at the same time, if we ask these human beings, if you ask myself, if we asked Augustine many centuries ago to explain what time is, that is a very difficult task. So we understand immediately, we leave the experience of time, but it's very difficult for us to explain philosophically, conceptually, what time is. So, uh, of course, we cannot talk about time in general. We must choose a specific perspective because we don't have time. <laughs> but um, as a consequence, uh, I would like to talk about time from the specific point of view of the discipline that I teach, that is semiotics. What is semiotics? Semiotics is the discipline that inquires about science, that inquires about meaning, that inquires about the way in which the world, including the texts that you study, literary texts, for instance, narratives, produce meaning, uh, give rise to signification. So, if you want to have a uh, very um, uh, simple understanding of what semiotics is, just imagine that semiotics is an expansion of linguistics. Linguistics is the discipline that studies verbal language and the way in which verbal language works. Semiotics tries to expand this knowledge to other systems of signification and communication. Uh, for instance, as an Italian, I make a lot of gestures when I talk. These gestures are also a way of signifying to you what I want to talk about. Hmm? So, I'm going to talk about time, but the point from the point of view, from the specific point of view of uh, semiotics, the discipline that studies science, the discipline that studies meaning. We're going to inquire about uh, time um, along four main dimensions. The first one is uh, that time has meaning. What does it mean? It means that time signifies something to those who experience it directly or through a narrative. Time is a uh, physical dimension of reality. Time exists. Time is. How can I know that time exists, that time is? Well, I can know it on my body, for instance. You know, my beard is getting white, <laughs> little by little, and this is a sign of the fact that time exists, that I'm going to become older and older, and at a certain stage, I'm going to die. So my time on this earth will be finished. Everybody has an experience of the fact that time has, philosophy would say, an ontological dimension. So time is, even if we don't think about it, even if we don't philosophize about it, time continues to flow. The universe lives through time. At the same time, we don't, as humanists, as philosophers, um, investigate time from the point of view of its ontology, from the point of view of its physics. 
We are not interested in the physical dimension of time. We are interested in the way in which time becomes meaning, becomes meaningful. Time becomes um, an occasion for language, signification, representations, and so on and so forth. So, for instance, uh, from the semiotic point of view, from the point of view of humanities, I'm not interested in the fact that stars live a certain amount of time, millions of years. But I'm interested in the fact that when I look at stars, I have an impression of time that is different from the impression of time that I have when I look at the world that surrounds me. I have an hint at infinity, for instance. So, in a nutshell, we're not interested in the measure of time from the physical point of view, in the existence of time from the ontological point of view. We are interested in how time is narrated. For instance, in novels, in movies, in paintings, in advertising, in popular culture, in myths, and so on and so forth. The meaning of time. The second dimension it is true that time has meaning, but it is also true that meaning has time. So meaning is placed in a certain temporal setting. And what is the primary uh, temporal setting of meaning? So in linguistics and also in semiotics, we distinguish between time and temporality. What is the difference between time and temporality? Well, time is the ontological dimension of time, is the physical dimension of time, but then temporality, it is the product of how language gives us as a representation of that time. It is the product of the way in which language gives a setting of meaning to time. I will explain that a little bit better uh, through reference um, to the uh, primary system of signification through which uh, time is, is placed in a meaningful um, setting. And this primary system is language, verbal language. Now unfortunately I don't know Chinese so I cannot really compare Chinese to Italian or to English, but uh, I'm sure that there are some comparatists and linguists among you. In most Indo-European languages, uh, there is a possibility to distinguish in language between what has happened in the past, what is happening in the present, and what will happen in the future. In English, for instance, we have different tenses to refer to the past, we have one tense to refer to the present, and we have also tenses, several tenses, to refer to the future. So, the uh, easiest way to give a meaningful form to time is to talk about time. We can talk about time. Through language, we can place something in the present, I see you, we can place something in the past, I saw you, or I have seen you, two different ways of referring to the past in English, and I can place something in the future, I will see you, or I'm going to see you, or I'm seeing you, you know, different ways in English to place something in the future, into the future. So. Uh, as you start um, uh, learning uh, new languages, you realize that different languages have different ways to um, give meaning to time. And uh, the uh, simplest, uh, the most important element through which languages attribute a meaning to time is exactly what linguists call a verbal morphology. So a way to talk about time, to place events or actions or objects in time 
through the tenses of language. You probably realize that uh, there are some tenses that do not exist in certain languages. Uh, there are some forms of talking about the past that do not exist in certain languages. Uh, there are some verbs that are used, some tenses that are used to refer to the past in Italian, my mother tongue, that do not exist, for instance, in Japanese. Uh, does it mean that uh, time uh, in the past is different in Japan than in Italy? Well, every human being realizes that there is a past. Every human being is cognitively endowed with the possibility of remembering the past, of retrieving some images from the past. So, last night I was uh, in this uh, wonderful Chinese uh, re restaurant. I'm able, if I want, to retrieve some images from this recent past into my mind. At the same time, language, the language we speak, also influences our way of conceiving time. Our mother tongue, the language that we have learned as children, also influences the way in which we understand time we articulate time, we attribute meaning to time. Hmm? Third dimension, time is meaning. So time cannot exist without language. And time cannot exist without language, not as a physical dimension of reality, because time is there even if we don't think about it, even if we don't talk about it, even if we don't represent it, even if we don't create narrations about it, time is there and passes by and flows by and goes on. I'm getting old, even if I don't think about getting old. Hmm? It's a reality, a biological reality of my body, of the universe. At the same time, in order for um, time to become not only something that exists in the physical reality, but also something that exists in the cultural reality, time needs language. Um, and it needs language even at the very uh, basic level. Think about calendars, for instance. Uh, we tend to believe that calendars are a very neutral way of uh, thinking about time, of segmenting time, of organizing time. But that is not true. You know that the Chinese calendar is very different from the Gregorian calendar that is adopted in most uh, Western Europe. Uh, in most Western Europe, uh, events start from uh, the birth of Christ. We say BC, but the birth of Christ doesn't have any meaning whatsoever culturally in China. So it is a matter of relations uh, between uh, cultures that uh, BC has become a um, global standard to uh, set um, events in the past time. Um, Iran has a different way of uh, conceiving the beginning of time. Uh, uh, Arab and Muslim countries have a different way, Israel has a different way, and so on and so forth. So, uh, this is to say that uh, even if we think about those devices that are used to measure time, clocks, calendars, agendas, and so on and so forth, in all these devices there is not only something natural, something physical, something that is not affected by culture, but there is also language, there is also culture, there is a choice. We choose to have events start from BC. We choose to have events starting from the Ejira in the Islamic countries, and so on and so forth. So, this is to say that uh, time cannot exist without language, meaning that our perception of time 
our awareness of time is always mediated by a certain culture and a, as a consequence also by a certain um, uh, language and system of signification. But fourth dimension, meaning is time, so meaning cannot exist without time. Um, there is a very important uh, scholar in the history of uh, semiotics, especially in the so-called continental semiotics, European semiotics. His name is uh, Greimas, G-R-E-I-M-A-S. What was the main idea of Greimas? The main idea of Greimas was that there are certain values that are important in societies. In each society, uh, there are some values that occupy the core, the center of society itself. The value of fidelity, faithfulness, the value of freedom, the value of um, uh, being devoted to one's community, and so on and so forth. At the same time, Grimas understood that societies do not circulate these values abstractly. We don't believe in these values because uh, these values are presented to us as values, as abstract concepts. But we believe in these values because these values are presented to us as stories, as narratives, through what mm, contemporary scholars now call storytelling. There is a constant storytelling of values in our societies. And how is it possible to transform a value into a story? Well, a value has no time. Faithfulness has no, no time. Uh, freedom has no time. But as you inject, as you put time into a value, that value becomes a story. It becomes a narrative. What is the... Um, general and abstract and, uh, according to Grimas, universal structure of a narrative. Well, you have a subject in the beginning, and this subject is uh, conjuncted, it is in conjunction, has a certain object, a subject and an object. Uh, I have this bottle of water. I am a subject, this is my object. Then, all of a sudden, he comes and takes my bottle of water away. That the story begins. The story of myself missing the bottle of water and doing something in order to retrieve from him this bottle of water. So I've retrieved the bottle of water, end of the story. This is the story. I have the bottle of water. I don't have it anymore for some reason. I have it again. Story. Narrative. Hmm? But uh, Grimas tells us that what is important in this movement is not the battle of water, but what the battle of water represents. The value that is inside this battle of water. Nature, for instance. I'm in conjunction with nature. Nature escapes me for some reason, and then I understand that it's important again. I have it back. Hmm? Now, Grimas also realized it is impossible to tell a story of this kind without time. You have to differentiate between a time in which I have this bottle, a time in which I don't have it anymore, and a time in which I have it again. So in order to have values circulate in a society, you have to combine values with time in order to create stories. This is the general understanding of um, the so-called generative semiotics or structural semiotics as regards the way in which cultures work. <coughs> now, <laughs> these are two posters. Uh, the one on the right side is the poster that has been created in order to uh, advertise for the three lectures that I'm going to be giving these days. And uh, the um, poster on the uh, left side 
has also been created by uh, this university um, in order to advertise for a lecture that they gave more or less one year ago, uh, always on uh, semiotics. So, as I uh, told you before, ontological time, time that is from the philosophical but also from the physical point of view, is a measure of how the universe changes. We experience ontological time in the progressive decay of our body, for instance. I appear different in the first picture uh, as I appear from uh, the way I appear in the second picture. So there is an ontology of time. Time is. Ontological time goes by independently from language. One year has elapsed from my first conference lecture for the University of Shanghai to my second coming to the University of Shanghai. And in this year, so many things have happened. And they have happened in reality, in real life. And uh, something has happened to my body as well. I'm one year older than I was when I first came in 2017. But, as soon as you narrate time, then time becomes not a reality, but a fiction. It becomes an illusion, for instance. Yeah, it is true that this uh, first poster was made on April 14, I'm sorry, 2017, but actually the picture was taken in Japan in April 2016. And it's true that this poster was made on April the 2nd, 2018 for this lecture, but the picture uh, was taken in Vienna in October 2017. So we do not realize that because we don't know that. We don't know what is the ontological uh, truth of these pictures. The poster doesn't say to us, this picture was taken, etc., etc. The only temporal indication that we have is the date on the first poster, is the date on the second poster. But at the same time, uh, we realize from this example that when we transform time into meaning, when we transform time into a narrative, immediately that uh, 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 elaboration of time involves an element of fiction, an element of illusion. So this is to say that uh, most narratives, most uh, texts, uh, semiotics says most simulacra, so representations of time, uh, necessarily involve something that is not part of the ontology of time, but is part of the semiotics of time. So as humanists, as scholars in the humanities, we are not interested in the time that is, we are interested in the time that shows. We are interested in the time that signifies and is signified. We are not interested in the truthfulness of time. Who is uh, the scholar who is interested in the truthfulness of time? Well, for instance, historians. Historians want to know whether a certain event has taken place or not and whether a certain place has taken place, a certain event has taken place in a certain date. So historians want to know the truth about time. They investigate about time that has been, that was. But those who study novels, for instance, those who study films, those who study paintings, they're not interested in the truthfulness of time, but they're interested in what semiotics calls the um, uh, verisimilitude of time. So, not time that is true, but time that looks true. Mm? And of course, these two posters uh, look true, meaning that it is plausible that the first poster refers to um, conference in 2017 
And uh, the second poster um, refers to a conference uh, uh, lecture in 2018. But at the same time, it is only an illusion because the pictures were taken in different years and in different times. They were provided, of course, uh, for the making of these posters. Mm? Now, this is a very fascinating uh, device to uh, measure time. It is an hourglass, also called a sand glass. Um, I'm pretty sure that this kind of devices and objects have been popular in China and Chinese history as well. Um, and it, it is one of the devices that human beings have created in order to measure time. Technically, from the semiotic point of view, uh, we can say that these devices work as indexes. Now I will explain what indexes are, according to the typology of signs in purse. So how can we use a hourglass, a sand glass, in order to know what time it is? Well, we cannot really know what time it is by looking at a sand glass, but we can realize through looking at a sand glass that a certain stretch of time is given to us, is going by, and then is finished. And how do we know that? Because there are some signs that tell us what the status of time is. What are the signs involved in the functioning of an hourglass? Well, it's very simple. Uh, there are visible signs, so we can look at them. There is sand in the glass. When the upper part is full, we know that we have the whole time. Then, little by little, the upper part becomes empty, and the lower part becomes full. We realize that time is passing by. And when the uh, upper part is completely empty and the lower part is completely full, we realize that the time is over. So, the position of sand in the sand glass, in the hourglass, is an indexical sign of the passing of time. It is a sign that uh, physically, through physical contiguity, through causality, tells us what the status of time is. It is a nearly modern hourglass, probably from the 17th century, 16th or 17th century, that has been used in order to measure uh, uh, short stretches of time. So, who is Peirce? Peirce, Charles Sanders Peirce, um, has been one of the founding feathers of semiotics the discipline that I teach, the discipline that I'm talking about uh, today. He was an American philosopher. Uh, he was one of the founders of the current in American philosophy called pragmatism or pragmaticism. Uh, it is, he is considered as the uh, most important philosopher in the history of U.S. philosophy. He was a mathematician, he was an astronomer, he was a geographer, uh, but he was also the founder of the discipline called semiotics, Charles Sanders Peirce. Semiotics has many branches. Uh, there is one branch that developed in uh, um, mainly continental Europe. Uh, it was called semiology, from logos, which means discourse, and semeion, which means sign in Greek, so a discourse over the functioning of science. Um, it is uh, a term, uh, semiology, that was first coined, invented, by the founding feather of structuralist linguistics, structural linguistics, Ferdinand de Saussure, Ferdinand de Saussure, in one of the most important books in the history of linguistics, the course of general linguistics, first said that linguistics must become part of a more general discipline called semiology. 
semiologie hein, in French. So from there, uh, a whole trend, a whole tradition of studies developed. Uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, uh, Roland Barthes, uh, Grimas, Hemslow, and so on and so forth. Modern narratology, Jeannette, all the structural, um, the structural tradition, including structural anthropology, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, and so on and so forth. But there was also a second tradition, a U.S. tradition, that started with Charles Sanders Peirce. Now, <clears throat> these are two paintings in which two sand glasses, two um, hour glasses, uh, appear. And I, I'm showing these two paintings to you in order to make you realize that uh, Yes, through these devices we can measure time, so we can uh, uh, appreciate a time from the physical point of view, from the uh, ontological point of view, but at the same time, as soon as we represent these glasses, it is not anymore and not along uh, not only the uh, physical dimension of time that is relevant, it is the cultural, symbolical dimension of time that becomes important. So on the left side, you have a detail from a very important fresco in the history of Italian and European painting, which is the allegory of good and bad government in a Toscan city uh, clo uh, called Siena, medieval uh, city, beautiful city. In the public palace there is this wonderful fresco that through an allegory, through, uh, so through symbols, through a symbolical representation, uh, tries to uh, depict, to uh, give an image of what good government is, or what bad government is. So it's a political fresco, in a way. And this political fresco also contains a representation of the virtues that are needed to the uh, good governor, to the good leader, the political leader. And one of the virtues is temperance, which is a kind of patience. In order to govern well a country or a city, you need to be patient. You don't need to be a nervous person. Hmm? We all know that. But as a way to symbolically represent this virtue, this virtue that is needed to a good governor, the painter Ambrogio Lorenzetti um, used exactly the sound glass as a symbol. So you have to be able to wait. You don't have to rush things. At the same time, you have to be able to realize, you, have to, you must be aware of the fact that time is flowing by. So as a government, as a governor, as a good governor, you have to be patient, but you also have to realize that your time is not infinite. So you must act, but you must act with tranquility, not in a rush, not nervously. Hmm? So it is a way of uh, transforming this device that has been invented to give a, uh, a physical measure of time, an index of time, into a cultural symbol. So in this painting what is important is not the way in which this sand glass works as an index of time, so as a sign that gives us a physical measure of time, because uh, if we look at this painting, it doesn't matter how much time is left. Mm? We are not interested in that. What we are interested in that is the sand glass as a symbol. So it's the symbolically cultural dimension of the sand glass that is relevant in this fresco. And you have a confirmation of that if you realize that the same device can be used to represent symbolically, culturally, other things, other dimensions of time. So you have 
another sand glass, uh, which looks very much alike the uh, sand glass that we have seen in the previous slide. In this painting uh, by Philippe de Champaigne, who was a famous uh, uh, 17th century painter, uh, entitled Still Life with Skull. Now, on the left side, you have a medieval hourglass in a pictorial allegory of temperance. And on the right side, you have an early modern hourglass in a pictorial allegory of mortality. So the meaning of this sand glass is not the same as the meaning of this sand glass, because the context is different. I mean, it is the same device. It is the device used in order to measure time. At the same time, this device is used to convey different symbolical contents in the first fresco and in the second um, image, in the painting. So what are these uh, uh, contents? Uh, what do these symbols signify? Well, we have seen that uh, in the first image, the sand glass is a, uh, an attribute, is a symbol of the way in which the good governor should act with patience, but taking into account the dimension of the uh, finitude of time. Uh, what, the, what the sand glass mean, uh, on the contrary, in the second image, in the painting, in this beautiful painting, I mean beautiful uh, considered in the, in the framework of Western art history by Philippe de Champagne. Do you have any ideas about what this sand glass could mean? What is the meaning of this sand glass? Uh, it is of course a uh, tradition of painting and representation which is uh, very peculiar of the Western art history. Um, so it might be totally um, unfamiliar to you. But at the same time, a person living in France or living in Italy or living in Spain in the 17th century, looking at this painting, could immediately understand its meaning. The meaning was clear. It is not clear to us anymore for two reasons. In my case, because I'm distant in time from this painting, I live in the 21st century, the painting was made in the 17th century, so in these four centuries uh, symbols have changed, uh, culture has changed, I might not be able to interpret this painting anymore. If I show this painting to my students, maybe they don't know what this painting is about. But this painting is also uh, familiar to you because you are not distant from it only in terms of uh, centuries of history, but also in terms of space and culture. This painting belongs to a different pictorial and visual culture. At the same time, through semiotics, we can also try to understand the meaning of something we are not so familiar with. Exactly if we consider uh, this painting as a sort of a, an enigma, as a sort of a rebus, as a sort of a puzzle that we have to solve, uh, what is the solution of this puzzle? Well, we'll see it uh, in the next slide. But first of all, let me tell you more about the way in which different signs work, because we need this knowledge in order to talk about time, a representation of time, in the painting that we have just seen. Now, this is the scholar I was talking about, Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, the founder, father of semiotics in the uh, US tradition, was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1839 and died in Milford, Pennsylvania in 1914. He was a genius, he was a polymath, 
uh, he uh, left uh, a thousands and thousands of manuscripts that were not published during his life and that are still studied by scholars. But he was also a, a very unlucky scholar. His importance was not recognized while he was alive. He died impoverished, without an academic job, unable to secure an academic position in the United States. So, uh, an unlucky life, but at the same time, a uh, fantastic, wonderful uh, fame after his death because now he is considered the most important philosopher in the US history. And it is the founding father of semiotics, also through the way in which he conceived of the sign. So how do you define a sign? What a sign is? Different branches of semiotics define what a sign is in different ways. But according to Peirce semiotics, a sign is something that stands for something else uh, to someone um, in some respects of capacity. This is the uh, main abstract definition of sign according to Peirce. A sign is something that stands for something else uh, to someone under some respects or capacities. Mm. And um, Peirce also elaborated a graphic model, a diagram, that we have reconstructed here in order to understand how science work. Now technically we call the process of working of the science, uh, the way in which science work, we call it technically semiosis. Semiosis is exactly the way in which signs work as signs. So this is a reconstruction of Peirce's model of the sign. Um, in semiotics, uh, there is a general awareness in the continental tradition, but also in the US tradition, that signs do not <coughs> refer directly to reality. Signs do not signify reality directly because otherwise there will be no difference between signs and what they signify. On the contrary, there is always this difference and as a consequence, signs refer to the reality always indirectly, always through the mediation of other elements. Mm? So according to Peirce, a sign is composed of essentially these three elements that technically are called the representamen, the interpretant, and the object. So what is the object of a sign? Well, the object of a sign is exactly what the sign refers to. You remember the abstract definition of the sign given by Peirce, something that stands for uh, something else. That something else uh, is the object of the sign. Mm? Uh, we saw previously the sand glass, the hourglass. So the hourglass stands for, is a representation of, signifies something else, uh, which is the object of this sign. This object of this sign, we realize, is the virtue of patience, the virtue of, virtue of temperance that is needed to the good governor. At the same time, the sand glass does not refer directly to patience. When you saw the sand glass in this fresco, you didn't immediately think, oh, patience, oh, temperance. No, you needed all my words, all my explanations all my analysis in order to let you know and believe that this is a sign that refers to patience. So the sand glass is not patience, no equality, no direct relation. There is an indirect relation 
which is the relation of signification. And how do you know that this relation is not direct, but is always indirect? Well, for the simple fact that the same sign can mean something else. So it means that the sign can refer to another reality, another object, if the mediation is different. Now let's go back to our model of the sign. So, <clears throat> as I was telling you, there are three elements in this model of the sign. The first element uh, we were talking about is the object. The object is the reality, the ontological reality, to which the sign refers. But we can grasp it directly. We cannot grasp reality directly. You know, if you know a little bit about um, Western philosophy, you probably, you have probably heard of Immanuel Kant. Uh, well, Peirce was much influenced by uh, Immanuel Kant's uh, way of understanding knowledge. You know, according to Kant, there is a difference between what he would call noumenon, the reality as it is, and the phenomenon, the reality as it shows. So we cannot access the reality as it is, but we must always access it through the phenomena. So the way in which reality shows itself. Peirce was influenced by this uh, conception of reality and knowledge. So according to, to Peirce as well, we don't know the object directly. We know the object through a sign, and in particular, we know it through a representamen, a representamen in English. It is a neologism, it's a new word that was created by Peirce himself to uh, indicate whatever represent something else, whatever stays for something else, whatever, whatever is there not because of itself, but because it refers to something else. So again, in the previous slide, this is what um, Charles Sanders Peirce would have called a representamen or representamen in, in Latin. Why is it a representamen? Because it is not important per se. It is not important as a sand glass. It is not important as a device that measures time. What is important is the way in which this representament refers to something that we cannot see. This is the way in which signs mostly work. They are something that we can see, we can hear, we can smell, we can touch, we can be in contact with through our senses, but what is important is not what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we touch, but the reality, the invisible reality, that through this science we can have access to. This is the main function of science. Science are composed by a, a perceptible element visible element, audible element, uh, something that we can touch, grasp with our senses. But what is important is not what we see, but what we can refer to through what we see. So we don't see the object, we don't see patience, we don't see temperance, but we see the sand glass. So the sand glass is not important per se, but because through the sand glass we can see something that otherwise we couldn't see. Because patience doesn't have a face. Patience doesn't have an image. Patience is an abstract value. So we need a sign in order to make this abstract invisible value visible, perceptible. Hmm? At the same time, in this um, model of the sign, we also find a third element, which is the interpretant. What is the interpretant? The interpretant is the element in the model of the sign uh, devised by Charles Sanders Peirce that mediates between the visible part of the sign, what we can access through the senses, 
and the invisible part of the sign. We need something to connect the visible and the invisible. We need, for instance, knowledge, we need words, we need explanation in order to realize that this is not just a sand glass, but refers to patience, refers to temperance. So, in other words, what we need is simply other signs. Now, there is a, a simple way to understand what an interpretant is, and it is uh, if you think uh, about how a monolingual dictionary works. Um, when you learn a new language, when you learn English, for instance, in the beginning you use a, a bilingual dictionary. So you have a word in Chinese that you know, and uh, you look at the equivalent of this word in English. But as you become a little bit more proficient, your professors tell you, stop using the uh, bilingual dictionary, use the monolingual dictionary. And how does the monolingual dictionary works? Well, you're looking, you don't know what battle means. You don't know. You want to know what battle means. So if you go to the bilingual dictionary, you have the word battle in English, and in Chinese it is... Dangerous. Voila. Uh, but in a monolingual dictionary, it's a little bit more difficult, because you have the word battle in English, then equal, and it says uh, receptacle used to contain liquids. But the problem is that you don't know what receptacle means. So you have to look at the receptacle in the same monolingual dictionary. And at the word receptacle, you will find another definition in English that says recept receptacle equal whatever can be used to contain other objects, especially if liquids. But then you don't know what liquid is. And then you have to look up at the word liquid and so on and so forth. So it means that in order to understand the meaning of a word, you need to use the meaning of other words. This is exactly how the interpretant works. In order to establish a relation between a representament and an object, you need something that you know already that mediates between what you don't know and what you know. You need a mediation that is uh, that takes place through another sign. This is something that uh, happens not only in culture, not only in language, but also in our mind. Uh, when I see this battle, I don't only see this battle, but I see, for instance, the fact that I'm thirsty. And uh, I don't see only the fact that I'm thirsty, I only see I also see the fact that this battle is different from battles that I usually see in Italy. And uh, I read on this uh, battle a label that I cannot understand, but nevertheless there are colors, there is a shape, there is a, a certain disposition of elements that tell me that I can drink from this battle, because this battle, even if I cannot read, I can understand that it doesn't contain chemicals or a detergent and so on and so forth. So, our reality, our environment, makes sense to us through this process all the time. So whatever we see, whatever object, whatever face, whatever word we, we hear, has meaning, means to us, because uh, a connection a relation is created with other things that we already know through this process that Peirce captured through the model of the sign. So this model uh, is also used in order to uh, create a typology of signs. We are surrounded by signs, by things that signify something that is not visible, but at the same time, science can be divided 
according to the way in which they work. Now, <clears throat> according to Sa Charles Sanders Peirce, or according to the way in which Charles Sanders Peirce has been interpreted, there are three main types of signs. We have seen one of them, indexes. There is another second type, which is called icons. And a third type that is called uh, symbols, indexes, uh, icons, and symbols. Indexes, icons, and symbols. So how can we distinguish uh, among these three kinds of signs? How can we distinguish, uh, how can we find out whether a sign is a, an index, an icon, or is a symbol. Well, it depends exactly on the relation that is established between a representament and an object. So if the relation between the visible part of the sign and the invisible part of the sign is one of causality, physical contiguity, then we have an index. We have a kind of sign that works as an index. The typical example, uh, example is uh, smoke. When we see smoke in a forest, what do we think? We think that most probably there is fire. There is fire somewhere in the forest. The fire is not visible. We don't see the fire. We don't know for sure that it's fire. You know, someone could be there with a machine producing smoke, for instance. There is no fire. We see a sign of the fire. We see a representament of this invisible object, the object that we don't see, fire, the representament we see, smoke. We need a connection between what we see and we, what we don't see. What is it, this connection? Well, this connection is our uh, knowledge of the fact that, in reality, when something burns, it produces smoke. So it is a relation of causality, cause and effect, physical contiguity. In order to have smoke, there must be fire, so there must be a causal connection, physical contiguity, physical connection between the smoke, the sign, and what has produced this sign, fire. This is how indexes um, mostly work. A second type of um, sign, according to the typology of purse, is icons. Icons work because of a relation of similarity between a representament and the object. A typical example of um, a similarity of icon is a photograph, for instance. We can recognize, oh, this is a picture of Massimo Leone. The picture resembles the face of Massimo Leone. So I can recognize from the picture something, someone, who is not there. The photograph is there, is a representament. It refers to something that is not there, the face and the body of Massimo Leone. And as a consequence, this relation is created through similarity, through the fact that the photograph resembles the face itself of Massimo Leone. So every time that we have a relation between a representament and an object based on similarity, we talk about icons. And then <clears throat> there is a third kind of science uh, which Peirce used to call the, uh, symbols. And symbols are those signs in which the relation between the representament, the visible part of the sign, and the object is not of causality, is not of similarity, it is one of convention. So is there any reason for which the word dog means 
the little animal best friend of human beings that we can fondle and so on and so forth. Is there any specific reason? There is no specific reason for the simple fact that dog means dog in English, but then you have cane in Italian, you have perro in Spanish, you have chien in French, you have etc, etc, etc. So most words mean what they mean because of pure social convention. There is no specific word, uh, I'm sorry, there is no specific um, reason based on causality. The word dog is not caused by the dog itself. Uh, there is no reason of similarity. The word dog doesn't resemble the dog itself. It is simply a reason of convention, social convention. There are some words that uh, do not work simply as symbols, but work also a little bit as icons. Do you know what these words are? All these words, uh, all languages contain some of these words. Um, but at the same time, they change from language to language. Uh, you know, when the rooster, there are some roosters here in the area, close to my apartment here on, on campus, there are some roosters. How do you say rooster in, uh, in English? Hmm? Fabian, <laughs> thank you. Um, they wake me up in the morning, and the sound that the rooster makes in Italian is kikiriki. In Chinese is